It's lovely Hello. to see you. Do you feel free to turn your cameras on so we can see you? you want to be as social as well and as welcoming as possible? Uh, hey guys, just for all those joining, if you could turn your camera on, that would be great. Um, just so that we can see your face and interact with you a bit more easily. So if, you're, if you can annotate as well, um, and you want to annotate where you're coming from on this map. Um, I don't know um, where we've got people coming in from today, but yeah. Just jump straight in guys, jump straight in. How do we annotate it? Do we send a message in the chat? And you should be Ooh. able to. <gasps> All right, it's discovered you can draw on it. How does someone do that? I don't know. I think if you go to the top of the screen, there should be an annotate button. Um, Just tap on view options and there would be an annotate on the drop down. And you can literally, yeah. Um, just plonk a stamp, oh. a heart preferably for where you are, just so that we can spread some on love. Oh, this is lovely. Wait, is it just where we are right now or where we're from? Either, either, it doesn't matter. Lovely to see a nice variety of locations. Also, apologies if anybody is joining us at like ungodly hours in the morning. <laughs> Thank you for making the time to come. So we'll give you um, a couple more minutes to let people join and then we'll make a start. It's lovely to see some LSE returners as well. Really nice to see you all. And do you remember to turn on your camera if you want to. people living in the ocean I see over on this side <laughs> or just people who really love a seaman but I love the swimmers thank you guys for taking out the time um, to jump on this call here uh, we're really excited to see you all um, and hopefully we'll have a spectacular year in the Mon Division. Great. Well, I think we've got quite a few participants so far. Um, so I think we're going to make a start now. Um, thank you all for coming. It's so lovely to see so many of you and clearly so many of you from all over the world. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us pretty soon um, in London. But for those of you who can't, um, it's lovely to be able to connect online for the moment as well. So my name's Annabelle. I'm one of your co-directors. I'm Tusha, I'm the other MUN director. 
And we have um, our training officers, Emily and Lena on the call as well today, as well as um, our EXCO who you've already met. Um, so just as a bit of an introduction to us, um, here's a photo from our last year when Tushar and I were both junior officers. Do you, uh, Tushar, do you want to get started with an introduction? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm Tushar. I'm a second year econ student. Um, I'm currently in Abu Dhabi, but I'm from India originally. Um, and I've been doing months since high school and I've continued at uni as well. Um, and I look forward to getting to know you guys a bit better over the coming, uh, coming weeks. Hi, and I'm Annabelle. So I'm from London. I'm living in London. I've always lived in London. Um, and I, I haven't done much MUN. I hadn't done much MUN in high school. Um, so I really started from the ground up when I joined Team LSE. Um, I love it because it's really cooperative and collaborative, but it's also competitive and academic. And um, it's just really a whole bunch of things that I enjoy. Um, so we're both really looking forward to working with Team LSE this year. Um, Team LSE, uh, if you're not quite sure, are the, uh, it's the competitive um, UN delegation um, that represent the LSE, and we're one of the divisions of UN society. Um, so the MUN this year, we want it to be really accessible for everyone. So we're going to give you a bit of an introduction for um, what MUN is like at university. Um, it's a little bit different from Thaiman if you've done MUN in high school, um, but also this is an introduction if you just have got no idea what you're getting yourself into. So um, MUN altogether, Model United Nations, is working together to solve global problems while role playing as diplomats and creating constructive re resolutions. So you can role play. Um, we're not going to use that word anymore, it's horrible, but um, we can kind of role play as um, one of a number of roles. Um, so my favorite to, um, to join in as is a General Assembly delegate or a GA delegate. So GA delegates um, debate issues on behalf of a country, not yourself. So you don't use personal pronouns, you represent a country and you lobby other delegates to work with you. Um, and then you draft resolutions on a certain topic that's already been discussed and that you've been debating over the weekend or the week. Um, and you follow the structure of the UN and the procedures of the debates in those committees. As for sort of my favorite, um, crisis is one of my sort of um, specialties, so to speak. Um, and essentially in that, you get a spontaneous situation as the name suggests. And you have to sort of move with the flow, um, try and oust the other cabinet and achieve your objectives, not only as a cabinet, but also as an individual uh, delegate, um, which are known as um, character goals or also secrets. Um, and you get a whole variety from historical crises, um, such as the Roman sort of rebellions, all the way up to uh, more modern day crises, um, including those around the world wars. And then we also have our chairs. So the role of the chair is to prepare, prepare, to prepare um, the committee materials before the conferences. So choosing a topic and preparing a study guide that delegates can read through and base their research on. And then they also moderate the debate across the conference and make sure that delegates follow decorum. So not talking like over each other and only speaking when you're being called on. So now we're going to give you a bit of an, uh, an overview of what a MUN conference looks like. So before you go into the conference, um, a few weeks before normally, or a bit later than that, if the secretariat isn't very organized, uh, you'll be assigned a country to represent and the topic that you'll be debating. So Team LSE is successful because we prepare well um, and we have a broad depth of knowledge about what we're going to be debating about. So it's important that delegates research the country that they'll be representing. Um, attending training every week means that our delegates learn important soft skills and it also gives you the chance to practice those skills in our practice debates. Um, sort of looking at the debate aspect of things, um, you have opening speeches, uh, which you have to do in a certain time limit, usually one minute. Um, and in that you sort of present your viewpoint as a nation on the topic of discussion. Um, and this is sort of continued throughout the rest of the debate session where you have moderated caucuses um, where delegates can raise certain topics in relation to the overarching topic and uh, present their viewpoints in a set time limit. So then we move on to a draft resolution, which is um, where you continue to debate different aspects of the topic and start to draft a resolution, which is a set of policies or suggestions. 
So you have unmoderated caucuses where uh, the chair lets you speak amongst yourselves informally and then you can talk one-on-one -on -one with other delegates. And that's where delegates have to negotiate with other countries and lobby them to agree on policy suggestions. So if you're interested in debate, this kind of adds an extra level to the experience. And finally, just to top it all off, um, we have final voting on the resolutions. Um, you can, of course, abstain to vote if you don't wish to. Um, and this is sort of to round off the whole um, conference and see which resolutions get passed. Um, hi, we have, a, we have a question as well just from the, from the chat. Um, opening speeches aren't just for Thaiman, we also use them at Harvard, which is why we included them in this presentation. Um, so we use them on behalf of the general speakers list. You begin the conference by opening um, with your country's position. Um, and yeah, so after final voting, when the conference finishes, um, based on your performance throughout the conference, you can be contended for an award. Um, and LSE delegates train really hard, work really hard at conferences. So we're currently the most successful team in Europe. Um, we won 53 awards in the last six months and 74 awards the year before. Uh, just to sort of jump in, um, feel free to put questions in the chat if you have um, any sort of thoughts on anything we present. But we will be having a Q&A, so actually, if I can override that, it would be better if you save your questions for the end when we're going to have a general Q&A about MUN and um, doing a MUN at LSE. Um, so we're just going to give you a quick um, overview of our experiences in 2019 and 2020. So obviously, MUN is going to look quite different this year, but um, it's hard to really um, explain over a presentation what an enjoyable experience it can be for um, the people who get involved. So I took part in ULMAN, which was a one day conference. Um, and this year we're also going to be participating in ULMAN. It's gonna be happening um, on the 24th of October over one day. And that's a really interesting conference if you haven't maybe tried MUN before. Um, it's a one day conference, it's not very intense. It's held at our arch rivals, um, King's College London. Um, arch rivals is a bit dramatic, but anyway. Um, and then I also participated at Manman, which was my first conference um, that took place over a weekend. Um, I participated in Knotsman um, as well, which is in, um, in Nottingham University. Um, and LSE Man, I staffed, which meant that I worked in the back room. And um, Anderson, the Secretary General of LSE Man this year, will give you a bit more of an introduction to that in a couple of minutes. Um, and then I also participated in Lyman and Scotman. And I think that my experiences with MUN in first year really, really added to my overall academics, but also um, to the sense of community that we felt. You know, it's really lovely to have friends across different years who you can speak to, and also friends who share your, your passion for academics and your passion for maybe international relations, international politics, and all of this side that you maybe don't get to explore in just your going to classes and lectures. Uh, just sort of building on what Annabelle said, um, I attended um, Oxyman, uh, which was in Oxford, as well as chairing at LSE Man. Um, what I found great about Oxy was um, was the fact that you have such a vast variety of of, of different cabinets um, and different sort of in, in the crisis aspect. Anyways, it was the first three cabinet crisis I've ever done, um, which is uh, which adds a whole new layer to the whole um, experience. And further to that, at LSE Man, uh, another great element is that you can chair at your own at, at our own conference, um, which is a great experience purely because um, you will never sort of be able to get the simultaneous benefits of chairing and sort of kind of participating anywhere else unless you chair in a crisis. Yeah, great. Um, so. We're now going to give you a bit of an introduction to the conferences that we're going to be participating in this year. So a lot of you have had questions about this on the Freshers group chat and um, speaking to us one on one. I'd like to preface this with none of us are the government. None of us know what's going to happen um, between now and the end of the year. So it's, it's very difficult to say exactly what we'll be able to do. Um, we're speaking with um, friends at different universities who are doing MUN around the country. And so we've kind of got the inside scoop, as it were, on what's going to be happening. Um, but at the same time, if there are a bit there, are, if there are um, more lockdown or quarantine um, requirements from the government, then things could definitely change. 
for the moment, we know what's going to be happening in Michaelmas term. Um, we know that we're going to be going to ULMON on the 24th of October. And after you've attended the boot camp on Saturday, you'll be able to sign up to attend this conference. Um, it's held over one day at King's College London. Um, it's um, a really enjoyable conference, especially if you're looking to get into MUN for the first time. Um, and yeah, those details will be available um, after boot camp on Saturday. Tushar, do you want to say about Oxymon? Yeah, so Oxymon is. Um Again, we, we as, as Annabelle mentioned, we don't know the dates exactly. Um, there are a variety of different committees you can join. I personally join Crisis. So if you have any specific questions regarding Crisis at Oxymon, please do message me. Um, and just to sort of build on uh, the points Annabelle raised, um, if, if you do well at Bootcamp, which is obviously on the third, we will definitely um, consider providing you a place of your choice on the committee of your choice at some of these really prestigious conferences like Oxymon. So please do check that out. Yeah, so as Tushar is kind of alluding, Team LSE is a very competitive delegation and spots are limited when we attend conferences. So if you do want to compete with us, you're going to have to come to training every week. Um, we know that this might, be, um, this might not be ideal for everyone. You might not want to come um, and compete in a conference. So you're definitely welcome to come along less frequently if you just want to learn some of the soft skills or you're interested in, involved in getting involved later in the year. You don't have to have experience before you join. So obviously I didn't have any experience, but I still managed to um, compete at conferences. It's all about you know, showing us that you have the dedication and the commitment and the enjoyment ultimately um, of Model UN. Um, and there'll also be opportunities to staff um, at some of our Lent term conferences. Um, again, we cannot guarantee that these are going to go ahead because of um, COVID-19, everyone's favorite friend, but um, we will have chairing trainings um, and opportunities for you to get involved in these conferences um, if you're interested. Um, Anderson, would you like to give us a bit more explanation about LSE Month? Sure. So LSE Mun is the biggest crisis only conference in Europe, and it's actually the only crisis led conference in Europe. So we're very proud of the fact that we're very innovative, that we take a very different approach to MUN than a lot of the traditional conferences. But as part of the fact that we're crisis, we do need a lot, and I really do mean a lot of staff. Um, in a typical MUN conference, you would have two chairs for a single committee. In crisis, that's more like, one chair or one staff member for every two or three delegates in the conference. So if you're looking for a way to get involved, if you want to get some experience working in a very different format to traditional MUN, or if you just want to learn more about what crisis is, then there will definitely be spots available for you to help out with LSE Mun. Um, of course, we're still not sure if the conference can go ahead yet because of government restrictions. We're not sure if it's going to be online or in person, but I will, of course, be around to answer any questions about that, and we will disseminate information as soon as we get it, especially if you're interested in getting involved. Yeah, great, thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to introduce our, um, our training officers for this year, um, Emily and Luna. So Emily, do you want to start us off? Hi, um, I'm Emily. Um, I'm a second year law student and I'm one of the training officers for this year. Um, so my role as a training officer um, really is to just build all of your confidence, like build all of your confidence, sorry, um, and get you ready for the conferences. Um, so on a weekly basis, this involves running um, training sessions, giving you the information that you need, um, teaching you the skills that will help you succeed at month. Um, so things like speech delivery skills, like sticking to time limits, structuring speeches, um, explaining the rules of procedure, all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I look forward to working with all of you next year. Hi everyone, I'm Lena. I'm the second training officer. Um, so I'm a third year history student. I'm based in London, although I imagine for the first few weeks I'll sadly only be getting to see you through Zoom. Um, so as Emily was saying, we're really looking forward to getting started with the trainings. Um, do not worry with, if you're a beginner is the main thing I can really say. Um, yeah, we're lovely, lovely, welcoming environment um, is what I really want to emphasize. And sadly, the first few trainings, uh, maybe even the rest of the term will be 
online through Zoom, but maybe later on we'll be able to have some trainings in person in small groups. So we'll see how it all goes. But it's a lovely environment. I've been involved with MUN ever since my first year. I was very new to MUN, had no idea what was going on. And through the trainings, I got to meet some lovely people and I've been enjoying it ever since. I was president last year as well and got to be very, very involved with UN society. And it's been the highlight of my time at LSE. So I really hope to see you guys around. Um, and now I'll just be sort of going over some of the things that we'll be discussing in future trainings. If you could change the slide, Annabelle, sorry. Okay, so I just wanted to introduce you to some of the things that we'll be discussing in future trainings. So again, I do want to emphasize that trainings are open to all levels. So don't worry if you didn't understand some of the introduction material that we talked about today. We'll go over it again during the boot camp. And again, we'll go over it in future trainings. Also, the MUN directors, Tushar and Annabelle, they're always open to questions. Same with Emily and I. You can message us on Facebook, you can email us, you can message the UNSOC page. We're always free to you know, help you and answer questions. So don't worry if you have no idea what's going on yet. But in terms of what we, what we have planned for future trainings, in the first week, we want to go over some basics. So introduce you to some sort of basic skills when making speeches, um, introduce you into how to write sort of position papers, and introduce you to sort of a weird MUN phenomenon of note passing. In the third week, we have a lovely guest coming in. Um, she was last year's Model UN Director, and Yasmin will be talking about how to draft successful resolutions. So this is a key part of MUN. Um, and in week four, we'll be talking about sort of caucusing skills and lobbying. Um, so this is the sort of more social side of MUN. So in MUN, you give speeches, but you, and also a very important part is lobbying where you come up with resolutions. And in the fifth week, we have, we sort of conclude some of these skills and we talk about ways to manage interdelegate relationships. And of course, during all of these weeks, we'll be going over basics. So it's not like we're constrained to just discussing these topics every week. And the trainings, they occur every Thursday from 6 to 7.30 or 7.45, depending on the trainings that we have planned. And I've noticed in the chat, we have quite a few questions, but we'll go over those at the end um, during the Q&A. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing you all in trainings. And just one more point I wanted to emphasize, this will be emphasized again during the call, but do sign up for the family scheme. Sadly, the trainings right now, they are all going to be online due to the ongoing pandemic. But with the family scheme, you'll be able to, you'll be grouped up in groups of six and you'll be able to meet some people in person. So you can find all that information on the UN South Facebook page. So I strongly encourage you all to sign up to that. I met some lovely people through the family scheme. And back to the MUN directors, thank you. Thank you so much, that's great. Um, it's lovely to hear a bit about your training, um, your training plan for this term. Um, we're gonna answer the, the questions in the chat after this session, um, after this, um, this activity. So please make sure that you do stick around for that, but we'll give you some more information about how you can get involved. Um, so we're now going to go on to a speech activity. Um, which Tushar is going to explain now. So um, guys, as you know, MUN is all about um, making speeches and conveying your points. So we thought we should have just a small discussion activity to sort of settle you into everything. So the topic of discussion is, should there be a universal language for diplomacy? And if so, should it be an existing language or a new one? Um, the idea sort of is to, to get you started. So don't, don't be afraid if, if you feel like you're making any errors or if you're feeling intimidated, this is a completely open environment. Um, so ideally, we'd want you to keep it to less than a minute. And please refrain from using personal pronouns, uh, such as I, me, you, etc. Um, so I believe um, Annabelle will split us into two breakout rooms um, where we will sort of discuss with each other and have a great activity. Yeah, great. So um, I'm going to split us into breakout rooms now. Um, please make sure that you do come back afterwards. It will be, be such a shame to miss you. But yeah, um, see you in a bit.
we're still waiting for a couple of people, more like a lot of people <laughs> to join. Um, but yes. Is, are people here based in London or are you abroad? Yeah, I'm, I'm in London. Okay, nice. In Netherlands. <laughs> Oh, yeah. okay. So the time difference is a lot. <laughs> yeah, only one hour. Okay, that's perfect. How about you, Orgi? I'm in accommodation, so yeah, I'm in London. That's good. Where are you staying? Bankside. Oh, that's a nice yeah, area. I had a couple of friends stay at Bankside. Oh, did you? Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Nice. Fantastic. Um, okay, not sure if I want to break that. Just give me one second. Sorry. Hi there. Hey. Hi. Uh, I think there's been an issue with breakout rooms. Um, Fernando, are you able to? Uh, no. So you have to make me full host so I can manage breakout rooms. Okay, wait one second. So we're just gonna. Um, no, I cannot. Can you close all breakout rooms and can we do it again? Yeah, sure. Hi there, I apologize. I don't really know what's going on with the breakout rooms. Um, we're just having a minor issue, so we'll be back with you in a minute. Sorry, could you show the question again, maybe? Yeah, so um, I can't quite show you the question right now for some reason, but the question was, should there be a universal language for diplomacy? Should there be a universal language for diplomacy? And just as a reminder, you can't use personal pronouns. So you can't say, I believe, or I think. You've got to say this delegate or the delegate of maybe the country that you're from or the halls that you're staying in believes this. Um, um, I think for the time being, you could just say the delegate of and just say their name, just out of sort of good practice. Um, is, is anyone wanting to start? Yeah, we may as well just do it in here. Okay. Uh, the delegate of South End on Sea would like to remind the other fellow delegates that there are various different languages in the world. There is no such thing as a singular language. Sure, English is, uh, is the most common language, but at the same time, I'm sure sorry, the delegate of South End is sure that there are other delegates from Africa who speak French, who speak Spanish, who speak Portuguese. So therefore the delegate of South End believes that there is no such thing as a universal language of diplomacy. And there shouldn't be one, quite frankly. Thank you, Delegate of South and On Sea. Do we have anyone who would like to raise perhaps any rebuttal points in their speech um, against this delegate? Well, we could try. <laughs> well, as a delegate from Bankside Hall, uh, we just like to say that one of the main issues within international politics and diplomacy is because people misunderstand each other, even within using one singular English language. Even if we just look through international law, uh, there are many cases when different kind of laws are misinterpreted or just well deliberately misinterpreted by some countries. Uh, just say the right to self-defense, for example. Um, and in these cases, it might be beneficial to have some kind of a universal language, maybe a newly formed universal language, which is, of course, really hard to create, how it would be way, well, could be beneficial in order to have the same understanding within diplomacy and have the same, well, notions um, being set, set, well, having the same notions being set for uh, each country. And now maybe we could have uh, better consensus within the international stage. Thank you. Thank you, delegate. Um, that was if, perfect time as well. That it was exactly one minute. So very, very right. well done. Um, just, just as a pointer, could you guys um, say your name before you jump into your um, your speeches? And sorry, was that the delegate of Gia? Is your name Gia? 
Uh, just call me Lin, but yes. Lin, sure. Okay. Um, do we have any other brave speakers just to raise fresh uh -huh. points or? I can go. Um, okay, sure. My name is Alex Ann, um, and I'm going to go as the delegate of Hammersmith. Um, so the delegate of Hammersmith believe that, believes that imposing a universal language for diplomacy is unfair and would have the effect of creating inequalities among different states and representative states as it would favor and uh, it would favor all the countries who have the means to learn, practice and use the language and have all these structures and would have the effect of creating inequalities uh, among states. Thank you so much, Alexan. Um, do we have anyone who has a strong view that there should be a universal language? Anyone who staunchly believes that that is a positive? I see Paulina. Hi. Is, that, is that correct? Yes. Paulina's put her hand up. Could you, could you unmute yourself and perhaps um, uh, give us your speech? So the delegate believes that actually there already is a universal language for diplomacy, which is English even in this Zoom conference right now, the language we're talking in is English. And what are we discussing? Basically diplomacy. So the delegate believes that there already is a language and thus there needs to be a language so that we can all talk to one another and discuss very important issues. Thank you, Paulina. I also saw another hand go up um, just before you, uh, was it? Or if everybody could raise their hand, we'll just do a list of speaking and we'll type that into the chat so that you guys don't feel too nervous about raising your hand every single time. Um, sorry about that. Um, so if you just press on the participants button, uh, you can raise your hand. Um, okay, so we have Samuel followed by... Followed by... Oh, there's so many of you. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, delegates. Delegate of Samuel, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Honorable Delegate of Indonesia, which is where I currently am, uh, which was where this delegate currently resides, firmly is uh, held in the belief that there should be a universal language for diplomacy. Frankly, with the stakes as high as uh, it is now, diplomacy is simply no uh, tool to be played around with. And simply, and, we, and the, uh, the United Nations needs a universal language for diplomacy to foster constructive uh, and <clears throat> understandable diplomacy, which will allow for sensitive situations to not be swayed through misinterpretations and uh, have crucial information to be lost within translation. This delegate firmly believes that there is a language that already exists that will be perfect to foster universal diplomacy. However, this delegate believes that it is not English, but rather Esperanto, an international auxiliary language that has been deliberately invented and designed to foster international diplomacy and believes that Esperanto would be the perfect language uh, that could be adopted by the United Nations to foster universal diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a question to the delegate. Um, what do you think is the reason Esperanto hasn't been adopted on a large scale? Um, perhaps there was a fault in it, which is why it wasn't adopted. Um, perhaps that may be the reason why it was not adopted. Um, this delegate believes that Esperanto will, was not adopted to the scale that it would have liked to be um, because of a lack of support uh, from other countries. Uh, and obviously for that, uh, reason that many countries prefer to ha to speak in their own languages and learning a language is not exactly the easiest thing uh, for any delegate of the United Nations to do. Um, thank you so much for your perceptive response, Samuel. Um, next, can we have the delegate of Niharika? Um, hi, this is the delegate of Niharika currently based in Singapore. Um, this delegate is the firm belief that there should not be a universal language for diplomacy. Um, first, firstly, addressing certain points raised by other delegates, which seem to claim that there already exists a language, for, a universal language for diplomacy, which is English. Um, 
the example that was given was this Zoom call, but, to, but it's imperative that we keep in mind that this Zoom call is initiated by an institution based in England, hence explaining why English was used, is being used as the language. It is not an, it is not an internationally, it is not an international forum, which is, which promotes equality of all nations. It is imperative that it, international diplomacy does not become inaccessible to countries, to any particular country around the world, to any individual not knowing English um, or any specific language would disadvantage uh, many, which uh, would discourage them from contributing to this course. It is also prudent to have various different languages because especially in this battered economy, having translators and providing them with jobs further helps our current case. Hence, we should continue with the system of multilingualism in international diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delegate. Um, now, can we have the Delegate of Anjola, please? Uh, please let me know if I've pronounced your names correctly. I don't want to butcher um, any of these names here. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, the Delegate of London believes that there shouldn't be one language for international relations this is because language is heavily tied to culture and i strongly believe that if there is one language people aren't going to bother to learn any others because of one language you can easily communicate with other people and also the process of picking one language over another language for the united nations could have destructive effects because if for example you picked english and other countries didn't like that language you get offended and then leave the united nations and that might lead to further difficulties and further international cooperation and also with future advancements in with future advancements in technology you don't know how easy it could be in the future to understand other languages for example you could have better advancements in better advancements within, with like live translators so i don't think we should give up on multilingualism in the un embassy yet yeah, because it could get better. Thank you so much delegate for your thoughts. Uh, can we next have the delegate of Ning? Hi, oh, Caitlin here. Apologize, uh, apologies, Caitlin. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, this delegate believes that it would be short-sighted to have one single language of diplomacy. Um, firstly, to address the delegate of Samuel, um, there is the, the reason this delegate believes that it would be um, not the most efficient use of time for diplomats to be learning an entirely new language when there are already a range of working languages that are the standard in the diplomatic communication. Um, moreover, as other delegates have raised, not only would um, sticking to one uh, language of diplomacy be short-sighted and um, promote inequalities of power by forcing uh, non-English speakers to adopt the language of power, it will also be short-sighted because language, languages consistently evolve. And if we, if we reference back to, I think, 18th and 18, no, 1800s, when French was the language of diplomacy, the fact that we have a range of five working languages as described in um, UN diplomatic protocol allows us to, to adapt to the way times change and to avoid sticking to one single language that might eventually go out of vogue. Thank you so much, Delegate, for your thoughts. Um, can we now have the Delegate of Nigham? Hi, yeah, it's Nigham. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Nigham. Uh, the Delegate of London would like to uh, present the argument that there shouldn't be a universal language, um, mainly for many of the reasons already stated by other delegates. Uh, the biggest one being that we are in a state of the world where uh, this delegate believes that we need to celebrate diversity and accept other cultures, uh, whereas choosing English, for example, would be a very Anglo-centric approach of thinking that you know English should be the language that everyone should learn which it definitely shouldn't because other parts of the world will definitely disagree. Um, as for Esperanto, I think it is already a failed language and it would be a big waste of time. While there are incredibly complex and sensitive issues that require a lot of attention to detail in the language that we use, I, be 
This delegate believes that that role can be effectively fulfilled by the use of translators. So instead of wasting time on trying to teach everyone a particular language, we could actually focus on how we can use our different ideas and perspectives based on how we've grown up to actually solve those issues from different angles. Thank you so much, Delegate. Um, can we now have the Delegate of Yixin? Uh, by the way, just, just, just to sort of jump in, um, uh, you guys are really doing a brilliant job um, for first timers and uh, we really appreciate all of you getting so involved. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, guys. Um, can we now have the Delegate of Yixin? Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, distinguished delegates, and um, good morning to those whose time zones are, uh, are not uh, GMT or BST. Uh, the delegate of uh, Zubar firmly believes that there are good arguments uh, against um, a universal language, but I think, th but the delegate believes there are stronger arguments for a universal language. So the delegate believes the best way to achieve a compromise would be through a a dual language model where English is the dominant language, but not a universally like the universal language, which is forced to be spoken. It, this this delegate believes that English should be a language that is widely taught, uh, but there are there should be opportunities for other delegates to speak other languages, uh, in so to benefit the multilingualism and multicultural exchange. Therefore, this delegate believes that English should be widely spoken but there should be plenty of translators willing to translate. Thank you, Delegate of Yixin. Now, just before we move on to the last two delegates, I was hoping um, someone would perhaps address the point of inventing a new language, perhaps, um, maybe moving away from Esperanto, maybe uh, something completely entirely different based on a different base. Um, would any delegates like to consider that, perhaps, in their next speeches? Um, could we have the delegate of Josephine? Uh, thank you. Um, the de uh, my name is Josephine and I'm from Malaysia. Um, so this delegate believes that um, the idea of constructing a new diplomatic language is a feasible one. And uh, the arguments for this uh, would be because um, as, the, as mentioned by previous delegates that the existing predominant diplomatic language use is English and now with um, the world hegemony moving towards a, uh, Asian countries such as China and India is no longer um, very relevant to be using English as the predominant language hence we, uh, this delegate believes the new diplomatic language should be one that's um, based on the roots in uh, languages such as Mandarin, uh, Hindu as well as uh, uh, Tamil, as well as um, other uh, Western forms of languages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delegate. And last but not least, can we have the Delegate of, is it Josiah? I don't want to, I don't want to butcher the pronunciation here. Yeah, just Josiah. Hi guys. Um, my name is Josiah. Um, yeah, I'm, this Delegate is speaking from the bank side. Um, and this delegate would like to bring to the attention of the General Assembly that um, the UN is an organization founded on consensus. And therefore, the question of language is one that will have to be considered through building consensus over time. And therefore, I believe that we should not institute a universal language for the sake of leaving room to negotiate through are many different forms of languages and by communicating through different forms and using translators we can actually come to agreements um, through the understanding of different policy and motions um, written in different languages so I'd just like to bring that to the attention of the assembly thank you so much delegate for those fresh points um, Annabelle would you like to now um, make any announcements I would love to make some announcements, yes. Um, if someone could make me the host of the group again, that would be really useful. Um, so we have a couple of opportunities to remind you of. Firstly, um, we have our bootcamp. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. I'm a tiny bit concerned that it's actually Corona, but here we are. Um, 
we will be hosting our boot camp on Thursday, which luckily for you, if I do get Corona, is completely online. Um, it's going to be held from 11 a.m. till 3 p.m. BSC, um, and the sign up has been available um, on our UNSOC website, but it's also available at tinyurl.com slash LSE bootcamp. Um, very easy for you to remember, as well as all the links being online. Um, that's available um, for anyone who's interested in participating in Team LSE this year. It's going to be a really fun day, and we're really looking forward to meeting you. Um, so yes, I can now share my screen, so I'll be one second. Um, so if you're interested in joining us, these are um, the opportunities and the links that you'll need. So this first one is the LSE UN sort of website and it's got some more information, especially if you're interested in learning a bit more about what we got up to last year, because why wouldn't you be interested in finding out what other people did the year before you didn't arrive? Um, so if you're interested in learning a bit more about Team LSE, that's there. If you're interested in signing up for our boot camp, we know we've got plenty of signups and it's so lovely to see so many of you. Please do sign up to the boot camp. Um, signups will close tomorrow. So you can't just keep messaging us 10 minutes beforehand for links. We need to know if you're coming. Um, obviously, sorry, please do come. Um, we're not gonna be super strict about that, but um, it would be great to know in advance how many people are going to be on um, on the call that day. We'll be having um, some introduction into how to do a debate from our lovely training officers in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we'll be having a simulation debate. We'll have a crisis overseeing two General Assembly committees, one for the beginning call today, who will be chairing you. So um, we've got Ryan and Clarissa, not Clarissa, sorry, Ryan and Dawn and Kaiser, um, who will be chairing you, um, as well as Marlene and Taya, who couldn't make it today. Um, but we've also got our Facebook group. Um, if you want to sign up at tinyurl.com slash team LSE, um, that will take you to our Facebook group. That's where we'll be posting all of the things that um, you'll need to know for MUN this year. Um, it's not the same as the UN SOC website, so or the Facebook page. Um, it's a bit more, a bit more compact, um, and it's just for the Team LSE community. And if you're really excited about joining um, Team LSE and getting involved with MUN this year, you can join our team. We're looking for um, young. Uh, excited freshers and also some um, some postgrads if you're interested as well this isn't just for um, first years so we've opened it up to anyone this year um, UN uh, MUN offices are going to be um, being selected soon and so you can find all of the information um, here at MUN UN SOC um, tinyurl.com slash MUN UN SOC um, that's all from us for the moment. So we're going to move on to a QA and a now. Um, thank you so much for joining. If you need to go, please do head off, but we're going to be answering your questions now. So um, I will start. We've got plenty of chats um, coming up in the chat box. Um, do ask them here or um, we'll, ask, we'll be answering questions if you want to raise your hand as well. Um, we had some questions, okay, um, we had some questions first in the chat, which I'll just, um, I'll just answer. So first of all, um, the conferences in Michaelmas term are not going to be in person, they're all going to be online. Um, however, we do need you to participate in trainings in order to know, you know, how you're, how you're doing in one and how engaged you are. So we're going to say actually that we're not going to be recording our trainings for this year. Um, we're just going to be um, providing a short memo on what's been discussed that we, we know it's really difficult if you're not able to come to London or to be in a GMT friendly time zone. But since the LSE timetable runs from eight till eight, we are still from six to eight within that region. So um, we hope that you're able to make that. Um, and we'll be selecting um, delegates based on your performances in trainings. It won't be intimidating for beginners. We really want to welcome you and make sure that you feel um, really engaged by um, AMUN. And um, it's not the same as UN training. We don't have UN training. It's just Model United Nations. Um, Tushar, do you want to answer some more of these questions? Yeah, I'm just answering on the chat um, itself. Um, just responding to, so I think a big misconception was regarding the difference between UN society and MUN. So MUN is a subdivision of UN society alongside careers and outreach. Careers is sort of, as the name suggests, the careers division where you can uh, 
look to um, develop um, diplomatic skills and see potential careers in diplomacy. Outreach is sort of the more charity related division of UNSOC and MUN, as the name suggests, is the model United Nations division. Um, is Harvard style model UN practiced in LSE and Yan? Yes, it is at LSE. Um, and, and broadly speaking, yes, you will have similar rules of procedure at London conferences. Of course, um, you will see different ROPs, perhaps um, minor changes, but on the whole, yes, it, it is adopted across, across London. If you join UN Society, UN Society is the umbrella for the three divisions. So your four pound membership gets you access to careers and outreach and, and um, more than UN. Um, if you want to raise your hand, Alex Zan, you had a question. Would you like to, um, would you like to? Hi, yes. Um, so I signed up for the um, boot camp uh, via the Google form and I just checked my email again, the confirmation and there's no Zoom link. So I'm just wondering, are you going to send it later on? Uh, can I ask Fernanda for a contribution on this? Yeah, for a bootcamp? Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, send that a bit earlier, but that's all right. Send it again. Okay. Thanks. Do you mean the Zoom link for the actual day or? Oh yeah, that's what I meant. I, I filled out the form, the Google. Uh, yeah. right. So we're collecting all emails on the form. So we'll just close the form. I believe it is on Wednesday, Annabelle, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, but once the form is closed, we'll email everybody that signed up with the Zoom link. Great, thank you. And yes, you can participate in all three divisions. Unlike in high school, you're not tied to come and join anything. You have no commitments. If you want to participate with Team LSE and compete with us at conferences, then we need you to come to training every week. But otherwise, there's no obligation to come to anything. You can come to a lot of MUN at the beginning if you really enjoy it and then find it's maybe not your thing. Or you can, event, you can attend events all over the society just with anything you're interested in. Um, you can get membership on the, um, the SU website. Um, and it's also there's also links to that from the uh, UN sort Facebook page. Um, Again, just sort of building on what Annabelle said, um, performing well at boot camp and consistently attending trainings really boosts your chances of getting um, a committee of your choice at the prestigious conferences. Like, because as Annabelle stressed already, we are a very competitive Mon division, and and we do have limited spaces. So if you're consistent in your attendance and continue to perform well, then that definitely puts you in good stead uh, to get a committee position of your choice. I believe um, that's all the questions then. Yes, so- um, I just had one last question, sorry. How many people like participate on like team LSE, like the actual like MUN team, or does it like change? Yeah, so we have a rotation of people who want to join. Obviously, not everyone can make every conference and we don't say you have to come to every single thing. You know, it's, it's like a netball team. It's absolutely not. You participate as you're interested. And so we usually send a delegation of about, 20, about 10 to 15 um, delegates to conferences. We're smaller than um, delegations like Kings, for example, who tend to send like 3,000 delegates so that they can win all of the awards. And yet we still win. Um, so um we yeah there's no um there's no exact um number per delegation it will depend on uh, the number of applicants we choose for that that particular conference hi sorry i had a question as well this is a bit more general so um how many like uh how many societies would you recommend first years joining because i don't want to join too many and then not be able to commit properly to mun for example um, Annabelle, do you, can I take that one? Because, um, so I'm currently part of three societies um, and, and it can get quite a lot to juggle. Um, but I would strongly recommend if, if you want to be part of, of the committee of these societies, I'd say three is probably the outer limit, um, simply because if you want to get maximum involvement, um, particularly with MUN, I know you have weekly trainings, conferences, which can get quite time consuming. So I would at most only balance that with maybe one or two other societies in which you're heavily involved in. I, um, I, sorry, I hope that answers your question.
And also we'd just like to say, um, in response to Josephine's question. So we'll know um, the council and the topic for bootcamp aren't important to know beforehand. We're gonna give you a really easy one page guide for um, general assembly delegates. And then for crisis delegates, you're gonna have a quick briefing before you begin. So there's no need to prepare beforehand. Um, it will be um, really easy and really accessible, if, especially if you haven't done more the United Nations before. Um, and in um, this commitment, is um, it is suitable for master's students. We do have a couple of master's students who participate usually in Michaelmas term, but um, we know that in the past they have petered off um, towards the end of the term and especially in Lent term. So um, it isn't always the most sustainable um, option for a master's student to get involved with, but you're always completely welcome to come along. And we have had master's students um, participate and do really well in our Michaelmas term conferences. Actually, just to clarify, the MUN director wasn't a master student when he was MUN yeah, director. Yeah, but he, he went on to become a master student and still participated. And yet um, you do need to attend as much of boot camp as possible. So the first hour is going to be an introduction into how we do model United Nations. Um, so it's a good, it's a good um, step up if you haven't done, um, if you've been doing Feynman and it's a good intro if you haven't done any man before. Um, and then in the afternoon, we'll have a simulation debate if you have to leave for some reason during the debate, um, obviously it's not it's not advisable that you you kind of duck out halfway through. But if that's the only way that you can participate, that's totally fine. Um, and for junior officers, um, our workload was quite. Um, it depended from week to week. There wasn't a um, like a solid you know three hours that we had to give every week. But um, it did require um, a lot of dedication, and um, we had to. Actually, can I pass over to um, Yasmin, the former MUN director, to give a bit more um, information if she's uh, around? We're passing something on to you. Sorry, Annabelle, Yasmin was making what? dinner. Could you what am I that? To say? <laughs> Yasmin, would you be able to give a bit of an insight on the workload for um, MUN officers? Sure, I mean, you were one. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Yasmin. I was the MUN director last year. Um, I think being a junior officer, it's just a really great way to sort of get involved in the leadership of the society and like be able to help out their MUN directors and things. I think, yeah, definitely like Annabelle said, the workload varies because in, in the beginning, there's not a lot that you can do because a lot of the events and things have sort of been pre-planned during the summer. But uh, yeah, you can definitely help with like trainings, organizing socials, um, whatever else the MUN directors pass on to you. But it's really, it's not that much work. Like it's not, definitely not unmanageable and it's a really good way to get involved. Yeah, it's definitely not as much work um, as I think people might believe it is, um, but also um, general participation in MUN, it depends on how in involved you want to be. Hi Alec! Um, it depends on how involved you want to be um, with general MUN. So if you're wanting to be involved in the more competitive conferences, you will have to spend time researching and preparing for your, um, for your committees. And also you'll have to attend um, the two hours of training every week and hopefully attend a social as well, which is super fun. We used to go to Weatherspoons every week. Sadly this year, that's kind of illegal, but who knows, we might just break the law. We're not gonna do that just as, just to be clear. Um, so then in um, Lent time, the conferences might be a bit more um, competitive and um, you might need, obviously this all depends on what's actually on offer, but you might need a bit more commitment. Um, so we spent quite a few hours a week preparing. Um, so for my Lyman delegation, my co-delegate Kaiser and I did spend quite a bit of time um, writing our policy paper and getting ready for um, our committee then. So it's as much time as you want to give to it and we really encourage you to like get the most out of one if you're interested. Um, so um, Samuel, could you clarify your question? And um, there won't be um, there won't be a second MUN boot camp if you're not involved with um, if you're not able to come to this one. If you're completely not around, that's fine. You can of course come back. It's just that um, we really strongly recommend that delegates do have the opportunity to get the this first introduction into how we do MUN. 
Um, and yes, we'll definitely consider applications for junior officers if you're not around in, um, in London in Michaelmas. Um, that won't be that won't be a factor that we disregard. Um, Tushar, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, this year is quite different. Um, traditionally, preparation for a conference would be um, a couple of weeks before. And I mean, we'll still prepare the same way in our trainings tailoring them specific to the conference, um, especially in the more um, uh, specific aspects where you'd have to prepare position papers, et cetera. Um, but, but, but looking at the bigger picture, um, look, we're, we're not gonna attend conferences in person for the foreseeable future. So in, in that sense, our preparation is gonna be slightly different this year. If you want to be involved in MUN conferences, would also be possible chair and staff and would it be too? um i think i think it is i think you can balance it i think uh annabelle's probably best suited to answer this given that she um staffed at lsc man and also chaired at youth man i believe no i didn't but i could maybe hand over to fernanda because you've got a bit more chairing experience in your first year okay um yeah definitely so i mean i can talk a little bit about my involvement with youth man and i also was supposed to be a chair at scotland but i got cancelled because of COVID on the first day but anyway so to answer your question for youth man i was actually part of the secretariat so i was csg academic so i was handling all the chair relations making sure that um study guides were being uh, completed in time and things like that. So it was a pretty substantive time commitment, I would say relative to perhaps what a chair would have to do. And I would say it was definitely manageable. Um, obviously you do have to put in the, the effort and the work, but it's not anything that's impossible at all. Um, and it's definitely very fun. I mean, if you're chairing, you get a nice, like a nice friendship going with your co-chair and you get to meet other people. So it's definitely, it's definitely worth the effort. Um, as for Scotland, so my experience as a chair there, obviously you have to do the preparation uh, ahead of time. So you have to write the study guide, liaise with your co-chair and things like that. Again, that's completely manageable. Uh, towards the end of lunch term, things do tend to get slightly busy depending on what course you're taking. Um, so I had a summative due at the end of lunch term, but I still managed to do it. So it's definitely, definitely doable. Highly encourage all of you to get involved. Um, so don't be intimidated by Perhaps the workload, it's not as bad as you think it can be. Yeah, definitely. And also Josiah's question, the junior officer role is definitely suited to someone who's completely new to MUN. Um, I was in that position last year. I tried to arrange a high school MUN team, which um, kind of, it, it kind of worked, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And so that was my only experience with MUN before I actually joined LSE. Um, and I was so nervous that um, I had to leave the boot camp because I was so nervous I got sick. Um, and then I like continued to participate and I'm I'm now like directing and I couldn't be happier. So like the progression is completely, it's completely fine. Um, and there shouldn't be any barriers um, to you joining in. Probably revealed too much there, but anyway. Um, yeah, if anyone has any more questions, please feel free to raise your hands. There aren't that many people here, so it's kind of like a friendly social at this point. Um, if there are any more questions. Anderson, would you like to say something? Hi, not a question, but I just wanted to add as well onto what everyone else has said so far. So many of you will understandably be worried about like wanting to take on something which seems to have as large of a time commitment as MUN. But what I would say to you guys instead is that this year especially, university can be a really, really hard time to just start to get involved in just because there's always so much going on. But at the same time, you feel like there might not be, so most of you will be doing international relations or a similar subject, and you'll only get very few contact hours. And these contact hours this year are gonna be over Zoom. And I say MUN is just the best way to like, A, if you're really worried about your academics, get into more academic thinking and to try and strive to achieve more there. But also just, it is one of by far the best ways to make friends in a very large school with a lot of people who you'll very likely not see very often. Whereas MUN just is activity we do every single week that you can consistently see the same people in. It leads to a lot of really great friendships um, at least in my case, and in the case of, as you can see right there, Taya and Yasmin, 
you can find your future roommates, you can find your future best friends here, and our entire flat. I just would oh, heartily recommend it to you. You all met through Man. Yep. So like the third years in this group call right now, we all live like within five minutes of each other. We all live in a group of flats together. Like mm -hmm. it may be a large time commitment to think about when you're in your first year. You get so much more out of it. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that as well, um, it's really hard to make friends at the beginning of first year because LSE has such a culture of like you go to a lecture or a class and then you leave, but you don't really mix with people. And so especially being on Zoom, I really feel for you guys like not being able to just meet people and kind of get along in queues or on buses or something. So um, in our first year, the first conference that we went to as a group, Man Man, um, is kind of like still my really strong group of friends. You know, most of the ex co were on that, were on that um, conference. It's really sweet and really wholesome. I really recommend you getting involved, like especially being able to meet people um, who have similar interests as you and also are like similarly driven and like engaged with um, like the real world. It's just, it's a really, really unique experience, I think. So I really recommend it. If also, I can if quickly questions. add on to that. So in case you haven't already seen on our social media, we're inaugurating our family scheme for the second year in a row. And that also is a fantastic way to keep on meeting people from UNSOC. So please do go check out the link to sign up that is on Facebook and on Instagram. And hopefully we're really hoping, we're just you know matching this with the SU, but we're hoping that the social for the family scheme can be in person at three tons at the SU. So do stay tuned for that. I'm gonna jump in real quick as well. So uh, tomorrow we're hosting our pub quiz, which is our social for uh, UNSOC week. And like Annabelle said, because it's so hard to meet other people with COVID, um, this is gonna be a great way to, you know, introduce yourself to other freshers, us, get to know some third years. So I'm just gonna post the link on the chat here and you can uh, register today and then we'll send out the links tomorrow. Are there any more questions, guys? Um, I can't be the only one, sorry. Oh no, go on. I can't be the only one wondering this, but do we have any word on what the, I mean, we know all of the empty conferences are going to be online, but it's just going to be like one giant Zoom call. Um, so, I mean, we don't know exactly how it's going to work. I know for bootcamp, it's going to be Zoom. Um, Annabelle, do you have any other insights on what the empty conferences are going to look like? I have a little bit more of an insight. Um, so some of the um, MUM people that I've been speaking to have been trialing different systems such as Hopin, I think. Um, I don't really understand, but we oh, yeah. have our own, um, we, um, we have our own um, like variety of, um, of different, oh, um, sorry, my screen's just changed suddenly. Um, we've got a variety of different ways that we can do um, conferences. Um, I think as well, as conferences like happen over MT, um, MT Michaelmas term for freshers, um, as conferences go ahead over MT, like the, um, the, the way that we do it will definitely refine. Um, I know that Oxford have chosen to do their committees over the space of two weekends with a one week break in the middle, which if anyone has already done one before, this seems like a real crackhead response, I've got to say. I hate to throw that word around, but my goodness, it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, but that is their, um, their, their response to um, this and they'll be using that so that it's a, a quite a different experience of MUN this year um, with a lot more participation over channels like Discord and Slack and maybe even Facebook Messenger. So it's going to be an interesting year, um, especially I know Caitlin, you've participated last year. Um, it will be different. It will be different to Harvard. Um, it will be different to Thymon. We're all on a journey together and it's going to be great. Yay. You'll enjoy it, guys. Don't worry. Um, it'll be great. Anderson, do you want to make a... Yeah. And like, just speaking to the other secretary generals and people who are organizing conferences right now, um, there's, we're all kind of trying to figure out what works best. So like LSE Mun is obviously going to be held in Lent term or possibly even later, depending on like, if it's at all possible for us to hold the conference in person, looking at what the COVID restrictions look like then. But 
please rest assured, like we are all trying to communicate, sharing like our best practices. Like our, we ourselves as Team LSE are trying out our own systems on the boot camp on Saturday. So we're all trying to figure out what works best, what fits the format best, and we'll try and make this as enjoyable an experience for all of you as we can. Are there any other questions? Fantastic. Um, well, do add us on Facebook, join the Team LSE Facebook group, um, sign up for the boot camp if you haven't already. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing you and meeting you in person, hopefully at some point. Um, and really looking forward to boot camp as well. We think it's going to be a really, like we've put a lot of hard work into it. We think it's going to be a really enjoyable day. Um, I think this is going to be the end of the call officially. Obviously, if you do have more questions, feel free to message me or Tushar um, or anyone else you see on this call. Um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Everything.